Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today, alongside Bob Pastorella, we're going to be chatting with John F.D. Taff. This is the third time that we've had John on the show, and what a cliffhanger he left us with last time. He said, I never told you about my childhood haunted house story. Well, guess what? That is exactly where we're going at the start of this conversation. In fact, most of the episode is dedicated to John's childhood haunted house, and indeed some other supernatural hauntings and tales that have gone on in places that John has lived, and even the town in which he lives today. So, if you're into hauntings, if you're into hearing tales of the supernatural, this is the episode for you. And before we get into it, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Kirsten Costello is a model. She has the face people want. She has the look people desire. But now, something else wants her look. Something wants her face. Something not human. Night Waves. The debut novel from David Irons is a new chapter in terror. Night Waves, the novel. From Cosmic Egg, an imprint of John Hunt Publications. Available now at all good bookshops. All right, well, with that said, let's not delay. Here it is. It is part one of the conversation with Mr. John F.D. Taff. And now for a horror interview. John, welcome back to This Is Horror. Hey, thanks for having me back. I always appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you guys. So last time you left us with a bit of a cliffhanger (laughs) and you probably (laughs) anticipated exactly what I'm going to jump into. (laughs) I I kind of figured that would be the entree into this. Yeah, so I want to know about your childhood (laughs) haunted house story. Well, I grew up, uh, I grew up outside of St. Louis in a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. And um, in about uh, 79, my dad, who was a, a, a St. Louis City police officer, uh, moved us out, way out. Uh, we thought at the time, I was only about 15 at the time, to a, a, an area called Eureka in Missouri. It's about 35 miles southwest of uh, St. Louis. And at the time, back in 79, it was, you know, very much rural i mean uh there was a high school it was a very small high school um most of the surrounding area was farmland or just you know undeveloped land um so we really my brother and sister and i really thought we were being moved out you know to the sticks and we weren't terribly happy about it at first but i you know i think it was probably a uh really good thing for me personally. I think I did a lot of growth. It, uh, met, met friends that I still have to this day. So it was a big deal, but, uh, we moved out and my parents actually built a house out there in a subdivision whose big marketing hook was, uh, you know, they only clear enough land on the piece of property that you buy to build the house. Now, if you know anything about, uh, American subdivision building standards over the last, you know, 60 or so years is kind of a joke because usually what they do in America, in American subdivision is they literally almost nuke the site from orbit. I mean, if you've got a tree in your yard, it's generally probably a, uh, a twig that they planted right after they built the house and cleared all the land. So, um, so that was kind of a big deal. So you would have a house and you would have old growth trees on your property. What they failed to tell you and that what we learned, and, and I, I should back up and say, everything I'm about to tell you actually happened. Now, you know, whether or not there was supernatural agency involved, I'll leave that up to the people who hear the story. But all this stuff I'm about to tell you actually did occur. So, um, but we found out 
a, a bit later, my brother and I were, after we moved, we were exploring the subdivision and uh, we found that in a lot of these areas of old growth trees that the developer had left on the property, um, there were uh, tombstones, there were graves. Um, and I guess, you know, looking back on it now, this is probably how the developer got around uh, developing this this piece of property uh, without having to move the graves. Um, you know, they just basically carved out enough room for the houses around where the graves were and left the old growth trees and the graves. So I guess legally they were okay. Um, but uh, we didn't actually have a, a, a tombstone in our backyard, but plenty of our neighbors did. And they were all, you know, fairly ornate tombstones. And they all dated from about, you know, the mid to late 1800s. Um, so we were in uh, the house for, I don't know, maybe six, eight months. And then we, you know, we started noticing things uh, going on, you know, the strange sounds in the middle of the night and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know. I think most people that move into a new house, they're not looking for a supernatural uh, explanation for any noises that they hear uh, coming from their house. It's just, you know, it's settling. Things are settling. Um, but they tended to get a little more bizarre as, as time went on. And, and most of what uh, I'm about to tell you happened within a, a fairly short period of time, probably about six months. Um, and it started out with uh, this really weird thing. And this is really the thing that got me believing in there was something actually going on in the house. I, I've always been kind of a night owl, even back then when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old. Um, I was always the one, you know, staying up in my room till 2, two and 3 in the morning reading. Um, and I started to hear uh, noises. Uh, at night, uh, as I was up in my room at, you know, midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And uh, I went out, it was a two story house. So I, I would go out of my room, walk down the hallway and listen. And I could hear a noise that sounded familiar, but I couldn't place what it was. Um, and when I got closer to the landing, uh, I, I could figure out what it was. And it was the kitchen cabinets downstairs opening and closing opening and closing opening and closing and you know i think you know your kitchen cabinets have a fairly distinct sound uh that you would recognize and you know so uh, like as happened with a lot of these things my initial inclination was to say well that's the cat the cat's doing something downstairs um so for the first couple of nights that i heard this I, I just let it alone. But then it, you know, the cat, I think maybe showed up and I'm thinking, okay, it's probably not the cat anymore. Um, so I started to go downstairs to see what it was. And the minute I put my foot on the steps, the sound stopped. Um, and then when I went back up into my room, the sound would start up again. And this continued every night, literally every night. For hours and hours on end. In fact, I'd go to sleep hearing the kitchen cabinets open and close, open and close, open and close, open and close. Um, so that was kind of the, the first thing that kind of uh, registered with me that there's something going on here. And I'm not quite sure what it was. But then we, we had a big flurry of, uh, you know, people in the house hearing noises. My mother heard. Uh, my mother was the only one that heard voices. I think if I had heard voices, I probably would have crapped myself at that age. Um, but she heard voices uh, actually coming from our deck outside, which my parents' bedroom uh, overlooked. Um, but one of the things that happened that, that kind of convinced everybody that something was going on was we woke up a couple mornings over a couple weeks where every uh, door in the house was open. Um, the front door, uh, our garage door, the back door of the house, they were all wide open. Um, 
and yet the animals didn't get out for some reason. The animals wouldn't <laughs> the animals wouldn't leave the house, which was kind of weird. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, we we started to kind of think, well, there's something going on here. But my uh, as I've talked about in the past, uh, I come from a, a family of readers, and uh, my mom used to. Uh, one of the things that my mom used to entertain my brother and sister and I with was taking us to the library once a week. And my brother and sister and I had a huge interest uh, developed from my mother of just about everything, you know, parapsychological, you know, ghost stories and the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot and UFOs and all that kind of stuff. So when we started to think, hmm, maybe there's something going on here, it was almost kind of comical because we were, you know, all of us were big readers in that kind of area. So it was sort of like, yeah, there's a ghost in the house. The, our house is haunted. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, but then it kind of escalated. Um, you know, the sounds came more often. It became a lot, you know, a broader array of sounds, footsteps in the in the hallways at night. Uh, I had a, a, a phone in my room, which at that time was kind of a big deal. Um, and the way that the phone company used to charge you back then was they could tell how many phones you had in the house by the resistance on the line when the bell rang. So I had convinced my parents to let me have a phone by telling them I would disconnect the bell and the phone company wouldn't be able to to uh, see that we had an additional phone that they could bill. So I had done that. I had actually opened the phone up and taken the wire out, connecting it to the ringer. So theoretically, the phone shouldn't have been able to ring, but I was up in my room one afternoon and I was telling friends of mine uh, about you know all this stuff that was going on and the phone rang in the middle of it and they had all known uh that my phone never rang so when they called the house they always had to you know tell my mother to call upstairs to get me uh but the phone rang um and we all kind of turned and looked at it uh and i answered the phone and of course it was nothing uh but you know i did subsequently opened the phone back up just to make sure that I had taken the wire out completely and it was gone and the phone never rang after that. Uh, so that was kind of weird. Uh, that kind of spooked a bunch of them. Um, my mother was downstairs one evening alone watching television. Uh, she had a glass of wine on a coaster on an end table. And she got up to uh, use the restroom and she came back and the glass of wine was in the middle of the floor, upside down, on top of the coaster with all the wine still in the glass. That freaked my mother out completely. There was, you know, there was no one else in the house to see that, but she was completely freaked out about that. The big denouement to this, at least the, the first denouement to this, was, uh, you know, as I said, my dad was a cop. Um, so he, he wasn't home a lot. He worked odd hours back then and he didn't believe any of this stuff. He was not, a he was not like the rest of us. He didn't, he didn't have any interest in the parasitic, you know, ghosts and that kind of stuff. Um, he thought we were all crazy. He never heard anything. He never experienced anything. So, um, this was on Christmas Eve, uh, and I had gone to, uh, to church with a girlfriend of mine back then and got, uh, it was a midnight, midnight service. And I'd gotten back fairly late and, uh, everybody was asleep. My grandmother was, uh, spending the night in the house for Christmas. Um, and I went to bed, went to bed. It was probably, you know, one o'clock, one thirty in the morning. And, uh, my father who could sleep through a, a war uh, was woken up by a loud sound in the house. And uh, he woke up and uh, thought it might have been my grandmother in the middle of the night who had fallen. So he got up and went in to check on her. And she was in her room asleep. And he checked everybody else. Everybody else is in their room asleep. So he kind of shrugged it off and went back to bed. 
as he told us, he was in bed for maybe five or ten minutes, and he heard another sound. Um, so he gets up again and kind of checks everybody, and everybody's fine. But then he sees lights from downstairs uh, on the main floor of the house. So he uh, grumbles to himself, thinking that it was me that I'd left the lights on when I came in. So he goes downstairs uh, to turn the lights off. Now, uh, the living room of our house at the time, uh, there was a couch up against one wall. There was a big uh, framed print that will figure prominently in the, uh, this story in a couple minutes. Uh, but on either side of the couch were end tables with those kind of brass lamps that were kind of popular back then in the late 70s and early 80s that you could touch. You touch them and they turn on and off. And the lamps were on. So he turned them off and went back upstairs and got into bed. And he said he was in bed for no more than a minute when he hears another loud noise. Um, so now he's thinking it's the cat, the poor cat that got blamed for everything. Um, so he goes downstairs again. He doesn't even bother checking everybody. So he goes downstairs again and the lights are on again. These two, you know, kind of good sized brass lamps. But now they are sitting on the floor. They have been moved from the end tables, and they're sitting upright on the floor. They, it's not like they'd fallen over. It's like somebody picked them up and set them on the floor. So now he's a little weirded out, but he's a cop, so he's, you know, he's like, okay, whatever. So he turns the lamps off again and puts them back on the nightstand and goes back up to, up to bed for, what is this now, the third time. And he's in bed for a couple minutes. And then he said he heard a sound that was loud enough that it shook the house. Um, didn't wake anybody else up. Just my dad. Um, so this time he leaps out of bed and runs downstairs. And the uh, the lamps are on again. But this time they're knocked over. They're, they're just kind of on the floor. Um, and there's this... Uh, my parents had a big framed print. Uh, it was an old... Uh, print from Budweiser, the brewery, that was a, a watercolor rendering of Custer's Last Stand, of all things. And it was enormous. I mean, it was easily, I don't know, four feet across and, and maybe two or three feet tall. So it was a big frame print. And uh, the glass and the print and the backing had come out and had fallen to the ground and the glass had shattered. Frame was still hanging on the wall. Um, so he left that. Uh, he was just, he had, I think he was pretty much done for the night. So he, he left it. And the next morning when we woke up, which was Christmas Day, before anybody could do anything, we had to go to the living room and clean all this up, move the couch out and clean the glass up. Um, and the thing that, that kind of uh, uh, cinched it, I think even my dad thought this was odd, was um, if you know how old prints were framed, uh, and I think some prints are framed this way even now, you know, they're they're kept inside the, the frame with the backing with staples. You know, there are staples that are stapled into the frame that keep the backing and the, the art and the glass all within the frame. And this piece being huge had a lot of staples in it. We We didn't find one staple. We, we didn't find one staple in the frame, on the floor. Um, that room was carpeted. Uh, there was some thought. We always joked that, you know, when my parents eventually would pull the carpet up, we'd find all these staples. And they did, actually, years later, pull the carpet up. And we never found, never found any of the staples that held that uh, print into the frame. So... Yeah, so that's kind of in a nutshell what happened. There were some things that, that uh, con actually, there are things that continue. My parents still live in the house, and, and there are some things that continue to happen to, these, to this day. Um, about five years after I moved out, my parents had uh, redone my room. They turned it into a nursery because my brothers and sisters and I were starting to have kids. Um, and uh, a couple years after they renovated, they called me and told me to come down. I lived, We lived pretty close to my parents. And so I came down. My mother said she wanted to show me something. And um, I got down there and she showed me a, a 
small picture, a small black and white picture. It looked like it was from the 20s or 30s of, a, of an old woman. Just a, you know, shot of an old woman. And she asked me if I knew who it was. No, I didn't have any idea who it was. So she said, we found this in your closet. You know, it was stuck back behind uh, the bar where the clothes are all hung. Um, and she said, we can't figure out who it is. We can't. No one knows who it is. We've shown your grandparents. Um, you know, neither your father or I know who it is. We thought you might know who it is since it was your room. And I'm like, I have no idea who this woman is. And we still have this picture. And I still have no idea who this woman is. Um, and then a couple years after that, probably five or six years after that, I had uh, my youngest child, my daughter, was about four, about three or four. And uh, she was spending the night with my mother and uh, still in that room, which was my old room, which was, again, uh, renovated into a nursery. Um, and my mother called me before I went to work that morning and said, you need to come up here. I need to. I want to tell you something. I'm like, I'm on my way to work. She said, well, let's just take a minute, but I want to tell you something. And I said, well, is everything okay? She said, just get up here. So I got up there and uh, my daughter, Molly, was uh, in a high chair eating breakfast. And, you know, we said our hellos and everything, asked how everything was. And my, my daughter was completely, you know, completely fine. Typical three-year-old girl in a high chair, you know, jabbering herself and eating her food and, my mother said, uh, Molly saw something in the room last night. And I said, what do you mean Molly saw something in the room last night? She said, Molly saw something in the nursery last night. Ask her. And I said, okay. So I asked. I said, Molly, uh, what happened uh, in the room last night? Did you see something? And she said, well, yeah. First of all, there was a phone ringing in the room, and it rang all night, and Grandma never came in to answer it. I thought, okay, well, that she's dreaming. Um, there has, there's no phone in that room anymore. They, it, it, since it was a nursery, they didn't even bother, you know, putting a phone in that room. Um, and I'm like, okay, so she heard a phone, big deal. She goes, no, no, no. My mother said, no, no, no. Tell him what you saw. And and so my daughter, very matter matter of factly for a three year old, just says, oh, uh, yeah, uh, there was a black dog under my bed with red eyes. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> that's odd. And I said, well, were you scared? And she said, no, he was just under the bed. And I'm like, okay, well, I think she was dreaming. But, you know, given the room and given the house, uh, it was a little odd. But, yeah, my parents still have weird things that that, uh, that happened in the house. My sister a couple years ago was, was spending a night there. And she was in her old room, which they really hadn't done much with. and she used to collect music boxes and she had maybe, you know, a dozen or so music boxes in the room. And she said at some point during the night, all the music boxes came on all of them. And she just, you know, it, it sounds strange, but her reaction was, uh, since she had gone through some of the stuff for so long anyway, in the house, she just pulled the covers over her head and went back to bed. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my haunted house story in a nutshell. Wow. <laughs> and I, kept, mm. I can't believe I kept you silent for so long. Well, we were just enthralled. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> it was weird. I, you know, and, and I do believe something happened. And, and like I said, the, uh, the kitchen cabinets were the, the thing that got to me. Because uh, it was such a ongoing and, um, you know, I knew exactly what it was. I, I, I could hear it. I knew exactly what the sound was. Um, there was nobody obviously down there doing this at, you know, two o'clock in the morning. And every time I tried to get it, uh, every time I tried to go down and see what it was, it would stop the minute I hit the step. So, um, but there were a lot of weird, just weird sounds. I never saw anything. I never heard any voices. Uh, and like I said, I think that if I had, I think that if I had seen anything or actually heard any voices, it would have been a whole different, <laughs> yeah. it would have been a whole different experience. Yeah. And, and given that you and your siblings had an interest in 
parapsychology once uh-huh. you realized okay something appears to be going on here did you start like setting any traps or trying to record things or would you no, stay you know i Go you on. know that that kind of stuff wasn't that big a deal back this is like 79 or 80 um and no, we never really thought it, it. It really became more of a joke almost with us that this kind of, oh, yeah, the house is haunted. And yeah, there's a ghost. And, you know, and then things would happen. You'd be kind of freaked out momentarily. But since nothing ever really uh, involved, like I said, nothing really ever involved voices or, or, or you know, any thing touching you or or bothering you during the night in that way or or uh, any kind of a visual you know apparition you know it became just kind of this like i said this this almost kind of a joke um so yeah it was it was weird and i tend to be i tend to be skeptical of this kind of stuff i i have an open mind about it but I, I do tend to be fairly skeptical. But but again, since this stuff happened to me um, and to everybody in my family, and we all kind of, you know, it all happened contemporaneously, so we all, we could all compare notes. And yeah, it's I, I find myself thinking that something was going on there. Now, you know, one of my sisters was a uh, younger than me. She was a teenager, and you know, a lot of. Uh, a lot of poltergeist research um, tends to focus in on teenage girls. Um, you know that that some there's some sort of energy going on there that that manis- manifests itself as a poltergeist. So, I guess if you believe that something was going on in the house, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, connected with the uh, the tombstones and the graves out in the yards, but. It could have something to do with that. I have no idea, but I do think something went on there that was, you know, unusual. Um, we and you know, my family and I, we we joke about it to this day. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I I live about two and a half hours away now from my parents, but you know, on the occasions when I go back and and uh, visit the house, you know, I always ask, you know, have you heard anything lately? Anything going on? And, you know, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. I don't generally think my parents pay much attention to it anymore, though. So um, if there are things going on, it would have to be fairly, uh, you know, a fairly big deal. Yeah. And I mean, with your father, it seems that up until the incident with the framed print and the lamps that... (laughs) You know, kept turning on that he was completely skeptical, didn't believe in any of it, didn't really believe any of your accounts. But then when he had that personally happen to him, did that frame or change the way that he viewed the world? I mean, because I can imagine. No. Oh, go on. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, he's a typical cynical cop. I mean, I think it gave him pause for a short period of time. But. Uh, I've asked him about it over the years and, and, you know, even recently he, he thinks it was all, you know, that was just the frame fell off the wall. Big deal. Right. Yeah. What about the lamps? Oh, the lamps, the cats knocked the lamps off, but you said the lamps were sitting upright. Yeah. That's, you know, you know, he's, he's, he's tinkered with his own memory. Right. Of yeah. What happened to, you know, to edit out any, chance that it would be something that he couldn't explain which is you know that's fine and any i think anybody that experiences these kind of things has kind of sort of got to kind of make it fit into their own worldview um but i i do believe that uh that that there was something going on and like i said i don't know what it was but there was something going on yeah i just imagine as someone quite skeptical myself that if that happened to me then my worldview would change yeah. because whilst whilst I'm skeptical, I guess I'm still open to the possibility right. if the evidence is presented. And, you know, I- imagining there was a supernatural entity 
within that house, it seems like it was trying pretty bloody hard to get your father's attention. It's like, well, well yeah. we've, we've turned the lights on and off. You're not going for that. We're going to have to go for the big one where we take the biggest frame in the I living think, room. <laughs> you know, and that, that kind of, that, the la- and that was kind of the last big thing that happened. And I, and I kind of, I thought over the years that there must have been some kind of an intelligence behind it because he was really the only person in the house who didn't, who claimed that he didn't hear anything, didn't see anything, didn't, you know, there was nothing going on. Um, he was the only one in the house that was just a pure skeptic. And he was the only one for that particular event that, that heard or experienced anything. He's the one who heard the noises. None of the rest of us did. He's the one that went downstairs and saw the, the lamps on the floor and on. And, you know, th- it was almost like it was focused on him. Yeah. You know what I mean? So to me, that speaks to some intelligence behind what was going on, that there was some effort to get him, you know, to either spook him or to get him to say, well, yeah, there's something going on here. But it worked for a little while, but I think it's, it's, <laughs> it faded away over the years. Yeah. And I can imagine if that had happened to me and I was trying to justify it, I might say, well, maybe I temporarily lost control of things and I threw the picture on the floor myself. But then the problem with that is, well, <laughs> why did no one else in the house wake up? Right. It's going right. to make a hell of a noise. <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, I almost wish, well, I do wish, I actually do wish that I had seen something yeah. because even over the years with me and I experienced a lot of the stuff, the noises, the cabinets, the, you know, footsteps in the halls and, and that sort of thing. I would have really liked to have seen something. I mean, it would, it, in a way it would have made it more real. It would have, you know, I think people tend to, you know, believe things more when they see them, obviously. Um, and I, I would have liked to have seen something, some, something, you know, shadow or a smudge of, you know, of a ghost on the steps or something, but, it, you know, I never really did. So I look back on it with a little bit of skepticism, but, you know, I did experience the things I experienced and whatever the reason is for that, you know, I don't know. You can use your own, you can use your own judgment. Yeah. 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 That, and that. You know, there, there's there's so many there's so many things about this. You know, especially like you know talking about how it has when you started telling the story it was you know kind of had like that poltergeist vibe, right? But the thing you have to understand is like what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, that's more common than most people think. I mean, obviously, you know, whenever they were writing you know the script for poltergeist, right. they they got that idea from reality. Yeah, you know. and and I want people to understand that this all happened before Poltergeist. So, oh yeah, um, but yeah, I think you're right, Bob. I think, you know, I think developers, uh, real estate developers, are are not known to be <laughs> the most <laughs> you know stalwart and upright citizens. Right, mm-hmm. and you know, if they're looking to to pinch pennies in a in a real estate development, yeah. That, that they find graves in. Yeah. They're going to figure out some way to get around having to move all those graves. And, you yeah. know, I have to applaud the people who built the subdivision. That was a pretty canny way to go about it. You know, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll do this in such a way that we make this into a positive, you know, we'll turn this potential disaster into a positive by not having to move the graves, but also offering people these, you know, fairly magnificent old growth trees on their property that they would never be able to get in a normal, you know, American suburban subdivision. Right. And, and you know, cause <clears throat> if you, if you think about it, like with my, where my parents live, mm-hmm. where I grew up was a subdivision and there were basically four models of homes there. That they mm-hmm. built. Yes. And so we had like, I think it was model B, uh-huh. you know, uh, so you had a, B, C, D, you know, and they would alternate, um, uh, and 
you know, so they're all one story homes and they all had, you know, but in the time they were built, they were all, you know, had with, you know, basically one car garage. If you wanted the two car garage, you know, and so they, they, and they tracked this stuff and we got to see how that actually happens when they built the subdivision across the main street. Ah. So, you know, they had a gigantic field out there. And you're right. I mean, and they bulldozed the whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. There were trees out there and all kinds of stuff. All gone. Right. You know? And this, you know, so this isn't, you know, something that's like, oh, well, you know, he got that idea from Poltergeist. No. (laughs) Poltergeist got that idea from reality. Yeah. The other thing that really, about what you said, that that is so... It's like, you know, it's one of those things that you read accounts of poltergeist, which I love reading accounts of that. Right, so do I. And, and, you know, in studying the parapsychology, they had a book called Strange Happenings. You probably, mm-hmm. you probably seen it years ago. It had you yeah. know, Yuri Geller in it and the men in black. Oh, sure. You know, the real yeah. men in black, you know. And, uh, who that's some, that's some creepy stuff because it's like these actual accounts and everything. Oh, yeah. But, the, you know, the wine glass with the coaster is just that to me, that's just classic poltergeist. Yeah. And there was another, uh, uh, there was uh, in the living room. My father had a roll top desk, um, off to one side. Um, and it was usually goes, you know, my dad was a cop and he worked all weird hours. So it was all his papers and bills and that kind of stuff. And we, us kids, we never went in there to do anything. Um, but he also had a little tape recorder that he used. Uh, he was a detective, so he he recorded a lot on this little micro cassette recorder that was in his desk. And we were this is one of the times where uh, multiple people were in a room. At the, it was like me and one of my I think it was my sister and my mom were all in this room watching television. And the roll top desk was across the room and it was closed. And my father's little micro cassette recorder started playing uh at a very high volume and like a fast forward you know that and it scared that it was one of the times that where we all you know it scared the crap out of us because it just came out of nowhere you know we're just sitting down there watching television one evening and and i got up and went over to the desk and yeah it was the micro cassette recorder you know and it was just weird that it just shows that moment to go on and right but yeah that's kind of it, it's kind of classic poltergeist stuff you're right and which almost tends to make me believe that maybe it was something about you know the teenage energy in the house right and if you think of those tape recorders i know what kind you're talking about because we used to have them when i went mm-hmm. to to college and they still at the base they had the same format they were kind of long they had a speaker on them you right, put a micro right. cassette in there you had to physically depress the yes, buttons. Yes, they were they were very clunky nineteen you know late nineteen seventies early nineteen eighties. Mm-hmm. You know you had to depress this button and it you know it would make that chunk when you right you know, and it would click it. in place and right. when you stopped it would click out of place. Yeah, so, so there was no way digital. that it, could it was just, totally analog. Yeah, and there was no way that the thing could have just gone on accidentally or you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was weird. Very cool, guys. And, and and to me, as, as a as a as a you know, on record as a skeptic, you know, I'm fascinated by that stuff because it, it's it, it's almost like it, it's like to me, it's like it's challenged me. It's like yeah, 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 you don't believe, but what about this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's you know? exactly the way I feel about it. I, you know, having read all this stuff since I was a kid. I have a, you know, a fairly well-developed interest in it, um, mm-hmm. but I do tend to be pretty skeptical, but right. But it was almost like, yeah, okay, you've read all this stuff and you, you claim you believe it. What do you think about all this? Um, mm-hmm. How do you feel about it now? Um, and I do, it, it, it really has uh, colored my life as a writer because, you know, when I, when I write things in the horror genre, um, I know what it's like to stand at the top of your steps in your own house and hear sounds that, that, okay, you know what the sound is, but you don't know why the sound is, you know, 
why you're hearing this sound in the middle of the night uh, from your kitchen at 2 a.m. Uh, over and over and over and over and over and over and over. I mean, I know what it's like, you know, to stand there in the dark and hear something that you can't quite figure out what's going on. So mm-hmm. that 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 helps me. I mean, it really has mm-hmm. helped me uh, in my writing to to put myself in the, in a character's position and know how you feel when when you experience that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then when you when you earlier you mentioned how you you wish you would have saw something. I have some some friends who you mm-hmm. know they were they were a married couple. They're no longer married, um, and I think that that part of of this was kind of like not really the beginning of their end of their relationship, but it had part of it. Right. They had moved into a new home that, uh, had some fairly creepy elements. And, um, my friend, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the husband, he even more of a skeptic than me (laughs) and was affected by, what was going on. And there was a point that, you know, my other friend, his wife, she confided in me that, you know, like she, but it was, it was not a, it was not a pleasant moment for her to confide in this. Right, it was right. very, it was very sorrowful is that she said, I wish that I could see it. Yeah. I mean, and I'm just like, and I've been haunted by that. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm I'm gonna end up writing about changing names to protect the guilty. Oh yeah, whatever, you know. But it, it's and it, it's it's something that's been long gestating and brewing. Uh, and I'm gonna, you know, really kind of, you know, morph the story quite a bit. That's only gonna be, you know, part of it. But that whole I wish, you know, right. and it's man and especially when you have somebody who's a believer and then they 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 subtly experience some things and wish to me that's just fascinating i find that yeah psychologically fascinating well and i i i can totally get behind your you know wanting to take that experience and turn it into you know to, into a story because you know, the the work in progress for me is uh is my haunted house story i'm going to write a uh i'm writing a novel that's kind of sort of going to be a a synthesis of my experiences Mm -hmm. uh with what happened at our house and uh there's a haunted house here in the uh, little small town that i uh live in that's kind of got a notorious reputation i'm going to fold that in and then i'm also going to fold in elements of one of the other big uh, hauntings that I that has really captured my attention ever since I was a little kid, which is um, Borley Rectory, um, mm. which is actually a, a, a British, a very famous British uh, haunting that mm-hmm. I read about off and on when I was a kid that just really captured my imagination. So I'm kind of kind of filtered this all through the prism of what happened to me. And uh, uh, the work in progress is called right now the working title is called occult house um and that'll be the the i hope to get that finished by uh this fall and so uh that'll be my next work that i'll be funneling out into the universe well i've got my credit card <laughs> ready is that what it's going to say on the receipt occult house that's, <laughs> <you know. laughs> that'll be cool i like the title. That, that's you know until i come up with something better if i uh if i don't that'll be the title but I'm looking forward to it because, again, just being able to, you know, to filter all this stuff through what I've already experienced, I think will, you know, it's always important to me to uh, working in dark speculative fiction to be able to 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 lend some air of reality to what Mm -hmm. you're writing, because I think that then when you jump to the the supernatural stuff, if it's a supernatural piece, then I think it, it, it just makes that supernatural stuff much more chilling when you right. ground the book in, in reality as much as possible. So when well, you yeah. ground it in reality and you ground it in emotion, how it affects right. people. And, you know, it's, it's for the longest time. I thought that I didn't like ghost stories, but I've, I've discovered that I do. Um, 
I think it was some kind of mindset that I was kind of burned out on the paranormal yeah. research, yeah. you know, the ghost hunter. Because I've seen so many. They have Ghost Nation coming back, you know, oh, yeah. whatever it's called. You know, and it, it's, I don't know, it all kind of, comedian Pablo Francisco does a, a skit where um, he does a DJ who recorded some uh, supernatural happenings. Uh-huh. And he, he, he pretty much mimics, you know, those, those TV shows. Is right. there someone out there? Can, <laughs> will, will you, will you talk to me? You know? And right. it's just like, guys, that's not really how you, 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 you would probably go about that. I don't know. It's just, to me, it's just, I don't know. And it's the well, same, I, it's just a different location. It's the same yeah. stuff. Like they could, they could have filmed that in a different room. We would have never known. Cause it's all oh, just, yeah. you know, infrared camera. <laughs> just guys wandering out in the dark you know mm. whatever what was but that yeah, oh it's me you know sorry I, I, you know i tend to agree with you having having read so much of this stuff when i was a kid i was kind of burned out on ghost stories by the time i you know started trying my hand at writing you know i did the bell witch uh, because again that was one of the i guess the two big pillars of my you know supernatural reading back then were the the bell witch and poorly rectory and uh, I felt I had a better handle on the Bell Witch just because it was uh, more of an American ghost story. Um, so I tried my hand at that first. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to synthesize Borley Rectory. Uh, but a lot of the stuff that happened in Borley Rectory is uh, fairly chilling. And, uh, you know, so I'll try to weave that into to my novel. Uh, as I go along, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to, you know, I'm really looking forward to the story probably in a way that I wouldn't have been maybe 10 or 15 years ago, just because like you said, Bobby, oh, I was kind of burned out on ghost stories. Right. And right now I think that the occult, you know, and, and ghost are probably our biggest, our biggest tropes that we have mm -hmm. in horror. And, uh, I don't see that going away anytime soon, um, though, you know, how, how long, you know, before it hits, you know, that peak saturation, we, we, we don't know, but it's, we, I've, I've seen so many, you know, properties coming out, books, comics, movies, right. TV shows, you know, uh, the haunting of Hill house is just, you know, that's probably one of the, the better, the better, oh, absolutely. you know, um, they're going to, and they're going to write it, you know, and it, it, to me, I'm just interested to in see what people are going to, you know, be able to pull out of it. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I'm reading, uh, Jonathan Jantz, the siren and the specter right now. Yeah. He's got a, you know, a new a way of looking at the, the skeptic in a haunted house. Right. You know, and, uh, it's, and it's grounded in, you know, it's grounded in reality. It's grounded in characters. It's grounded in, in emotions, and it's it's really interesting, you know. And I'm just, I'm to me, it's like I, I feel like I've kind of missed out on some of that stuff. Right. And I'm looking Be forward because to because I got so burned out on it in the 70s. It's yeah. Like, in the 80s, it's like, oh man, some more ghosts. No, you know. No, now it's, it's not like it's, it's come back. You know. It's like any other trope in horror. You know, it has its day. It cycles through it gets burned mm -hmm. out and something else replaces it but i'm ready for the ghost story to come back and and i'm um, actually that's the book that um mm -hmm. that's on my to be red pile right now jonathan's book um yeah. that i'm looking and forward to reading and the thing is and here's the thing it's never really gone away no 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 we've and gone and, away from it you know the thing about ghosts that uh, i think sets it apart from you know uh vampires or anything like that I mean, ghosts are such a common element throughout all of human history and almost mm -hmm. every culture has a ghost story so it's it's so uh you know it's so unique to the human experience uh that you know it, i don't think it's ever going to go away um right. like i said it may cycle in and out in popularity but um i don't think it's ever going to go away Right. Yeah. As long Which as is good. You know, I, I don't think there's anything more relaxing to me, at least, than reading a really, really good ghost story at night. You know, mm. you, some fall night when the moon's out and you're, you know, curled up in your favorite chair and you, you know, maybe you got a fire going and, uh, 
a cup of tea or a glass of whiskey, maybe. There we go. <laughs> and, a, you know, in a really, really good ghost story, you know, that's really, that can be really, really fulfilling. Mm hmm. I can see that. I can see that. And now, you know, this year was my was kind of like my exposure to Mr. James. And God damn it, guys wrote some creepy shit, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, all the old ghost writers, you know, Wilkie Collins and, mm. you know, people like that, that, their stories really do hold up. I mean, they're dated, <laughs> yeah. obviously, the language and everything. But the, 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 the scare in the story, I think, holds up remarkably well. Yeah, it's just you know, the, to me, the whole the, the the creepy reaching, reaching and touching and feeling yes. like hair and teeth, and, <laughs> and so it, and it's one of the things I've always felt. And of course, you know, you know, like you, if you read Shadowland and you read, yes, you know, uh, the ghost story with Peter Straub, mm -hmm. that we have some ghostly entier, entities that are corporeal. They they inhabit a physical. Right, right. Space, and he got all that from 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 M. R. James, you know. Right, and it's just now going back, you know, finally reading the source, you right. know, and you're like, man, it it all ties together. It's so cool. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if part of the reason why you both got a bit burnt out on ghost stories was maybe. 10 15 years ago there was quite a move towards the paranormal investigator at the expense of the characters so it was more concerned with trying to prove whether there is or isn't a ghost and using right. all sorts of machines whereas i think now the shift is on the characters and the emotions and how these people are affected and i think in terms of story and particularly timeless storytelling you want to be concerned with the people and that that's why things yeah. like mr james hold up more because it's not concerned with the latest gadgetery and trying to prove whether there actually is or isn't some sort of supernatural phenomena i mean I don't think we're ever going to prove one way or another. So why don't we concentrate <laughs> on the actual people and the characters? Well, and I, I totally agree with you, Michael. And I, and I think that that, you know, mm -hmm. is sort of the way that, uh, that I write, you know, it's all, it's all emotion based. And, and if you look, if you, if you look in the literature, the ghost literature and uh, for reasons why, you know, entities might be appearing, you know, one of the theories that has always appealed to me is that, you know, some things say in a house, some events in a house, uh, leave a mark on the house, the ether, whatever you want to say, you know, some very emotional things, murders or, or deaths or, you know, loss of some kind that, that kind of leaves a mark on that or, almost makes a recording within the ether and then that is played back uh when the uh you know when the the atmosphere is right um you know that's a that's a theory of of ghosts that that has always appealed to me and it kind of fits in the way with i write with with all the emotions and everything and and certainly that's going to be a big thread within the the book that i'm writing now that that sort of emotional uh, investment, uh, and sort of heavy emotional, big emotional stuff that, that would leave its mark and then be played back, you know, over time. So I think you're right. I, I think it's more interesting to me to, to examine the people who are experiencing, uh, these events and what they're thinking and, and the emotions that go into it rather than, you know, a couple of douchebags staggering around, yeah. a dark house with you know mm -hmm. you know low light glasses on and uh, those whatever those meters are that they're always pointing at things and then this new these new uh you know what do they call them spirit boxes uh, that that you know kind of sort through the white noise and come up with evp now i'm gonna back up and say something i find evp to be incredibly creepy 
Um, I don't know what, I don't know if there's much to it, but I think it's incredibly creepy. Um, it's one of the things that I can, uh, occupy myself with late at night when I'm not writing or when I want to, you know, uh, get away from it for a little bit, uh, that will raise goosebumps on my, on my arms. It's, I, I do find it incredibly creepy, but you know, I watch a lot of these shows. I don't watch them anymore, but when, when a lot of these shows came out, Ghost Adventures and um, that kind of stuff, you know, I would watch them initially being really excited. Oh, this is going to be cool. You're going to go after ghosts, maybe see some stuff. But I don't really recall seeing anything on any episode of any of those shows where I thought, wow, now that's cool. You know, most of it's just ridiculous you know, well, that's probably not anything or that's not anything or that's certainly not anything. So I don't know. Have you guys ever seen any episodes of these shows that where you thought, hey, that's that's a big deal? No, I've, I've, I've been extremely disappointed because it, it seems like to me the, the researchers have to take a gigantic, massive leap <laughs> just to say. And there, there was a sound. We don't know exactly what it was. Right. That could possibly be, and they drag that out as long as they possibly can right. before having to take a breath, say that there, there could be some there could be some paranormal activity, and then they link it up to some kind of percentage, maybe about thirteen point four percent, you know, <laughs> based upon our science and everything like that. And it's funny too because usually these homes are like abandoned or there yes. nobody lives there. Right. Well, they're they're estates now, and so they go and they find these homes, you know, and you rarely see any type of family, you know. And to me, I think that, you know, and even though that genre is kind of just overblown and saturated and, and all of that with the paranormal, you know, to me, there's there's part of me that says there's still some things that they could, you know, work with that. Sure. You sure. know, Uh you know, and it all would depend upon, you know, character motivations and things like that. You know, you, you combine that with some, you know, with some pretty nasty people, uh-huh. you know, on both ends, both ends of the spectrum, you know, <laughs> right. the family or the researchers, mm-hmm. you know. And I think I think there's some, some there's some stories, I think some films recently that have done that where some people were basically uh, creating the hoax. But, you know, it comes back to bite them and things like that. Right. And uh, so, you know, and probably probably not the the best execution of the idea, which just means that someone else is going to do it. And it's probably eventually. Gonna, right. Yeah. And it's going to hopefully be better, you know, but it's, uh, you know, to me, that particular branch, you know, is kind of it's kind of overblown, though. Yeah. A recent one I liked was the innkeepers. So. I haven't seen that one. You know, I used to, uh, I'd hear about these shows and I'd go into, you know, I'd watch the first episode of two, just thinking, you know, I really, I really hope they are able to do something here. I really hope that they're able to find something that show me something that will make me think, Hmm, maybe they got something there, but you know, you watch an episode or two and you're like, that's just another bunch of people stumbling around in the dark and waving the dubious scientific equipment in the air and, whatever so I, I tend not to even bother with them anymore i you know uh, my mother and one of my sisters are still deeply into all this stuff like ghost adventures and and that kind of thing um uh, but i i don't pay attention to it anymore yeah i wonder if the distinction and why we perhaps find the stories where say a family moves into a house to be a little bit better than when we have a couple of ghost hunters going around (laughs) looking for the ghost is perhaps the ghost hunters i mean they are hunting they are the ones looking but surely it's scarier to move into a house or to move into an area you are not looking for anything supernatural exactly and then it is thrust into your life Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's the the key is is that you know, these stories, like you said, where, where people move into a house or or whatever, and, you know, they're just wanting to go about their daily life, their, their normal life, and they're not expecting any, you know, otherworldly stuff. And then it happens, and you've got to deal with all that, do you believe it, what's going on, um, you know, 
all that kind of stuff. And it, it forces you to think about things that you probably don't think about in your daily life, you know, death and what happens after death and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I think that's a lot more interesting ultimately than people stumbling around in the dark with, you know, voice meters or whatever. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. I t- totally agree with that. You know, and, and it's, it, to me, there's, there's a, another aspect of it that's often overlooked is that you, let's say like in, in, in particular story that you have somebody who moves into a new home or an old home or something like that. And then they have one incident that's really kind of creepy and they leave, they get out of the, yes. lease. they get, you know, <laughs> And it's like, okay, so in, in most cases, I say probably 90% of the time, there's not nothing there. It's like, right. there's something that happened. We didn't really care what it was. Yeah. Supernatural or not, doesn't matter. Hey, we moved. Right. No big deal. <laughs> what if that thing followed them? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so it's like, hey, you know, that's not, that's, and of course, that's not really original, Bob. It's like, no, not <laughs> the idea is not. But there's there's room for improvement on that. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And it might not be an original idea, but it's certainly something that hasn't been explored as much as I would like it to. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. So if you're listening and you're thinking about writing <laughs> or making something within that genre, mm-hmm. please go for it. Absolutely. And the cool thing is, is that all like everyone listening and everyone in, in talking right now could come up with use that same idea and everybody write something at one time and it would be all completely different. Exactly. It's how that would yeah, work. Exactly. It's a big it's a big canvas to paint on with a ghost story. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm really uh, I'm really excited for the, the book that I'm writing right now. So. Hopefully people will dig it when it comes out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think they will. And I think as we've said, the appetite for that type of fiction is large at the moment. So right. you know, Bob's got his credit card ready. I've got <laughs> mine ready too, so let us know. <laughs> Absolutely. But I wonder back to your childhood haunted house. Is that the only place where you've experience something that you could say is potentially supernatural or have other things gone on in your life thus far? Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, uh, I've lived in some, you know, kind of hinky places that you would think might be haunted, but weren't, uh, when my wife and I met, she had a house in, uh, the city of St. Louis, which is an older house, about a hundred year old house. And, you know, it was certainly an eccentric house, but, uh, nothing, nothing untoward seemed to have happened there. Uh, and that's pretty much it. We moved down here to, uh, Southern Illinois about, uh, was it about five years ago now? And, uh, we bought a house that's probably, I think it was built in 1984. Um, and uh, we haven't really experienced anything weird uh, with this one. So, yeah, no, not really. Um, it, it's funny. You know, we, I, we talk about my dad, my dad being that cynical cop and, and having that experience there at the end of uh, the most active period of haunting at the house. Uh, when his mother passed away back in about, I think it was 2000 or 2001, my grandmother passed away. He, uh, he had one of those, uh, uh, incidents that a lot of people have when a loved one passes where he remembers waking up in the middle of the night, uh, because he felt something cold and his mother was seated at the foot of his bed, um, uh, basically just to tell him that she was fine and, uh, you know, not to worry about her. And that, that really rattled him. But I think that was more of an emotional connection with him and and uh, probably not really hard to uh, to figure out why. But, yeah, he was pretty rattled about that. And he's actually still kind of if you bring it up, he's still kind of rattled by it. Yeah. I mean, you can see why just because of that 
personal connection, even yeah. though as a skeptic, that one would be easier to explain away. I mean, yeah, obviously. Yeah, that's right. That You could just say that nah, you were just dreaming. You really didn't wake up. Although he's adamant he was awake. So, yeah. Yeah. I just Whatever, think, but I. Yeah, I, I think even no. if you're not dreaming, it's like, well, you're clearly thinking a lot about your mother at that point. So, exactly. I mean, we, we could hallucinate people. I mean, how on earth do you, how do you prove either way? I mean, my, my mother had a similar thing when my great uncle passed away and she said that she saw him numerous times. She smelt him. She could like feel him there with right, her. I right. mean, you, <laughs> I, she can't really prove that it happened, and we can't disprove it didn't happen. You just right. can't can't prove either way. You know, and that's just one of those things that again makes um, ghosts such a uh, a common thread in with humanity. I mean, you talk to anybody, and you know, maybe they haven't had that kind of experience, but they probably know someone, you know, a close a close family member who's had you know, some kind of experience like that. So, you know, I, uh, I think that ghost stories where they're done well can really touch that place of commonality with people that everybody, even if they don't have that experience directly, they, they know someone who's seen something, heard something, felt something. Um, so when a ghost story is done really well, I think that, that people can really, really relate to it. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I agree with that 100%. What about this haunted house in the village that you're living at the moment? You said alongside Borley Rectory and the house that you grew up in, that was... Yeah, there was a, there's a house here in town um, where a, a relatively famous murder, uh, at least famous in the area, uh, occurred. I think it was back in the 20s. Um local judge uh and his wife lived in the house it's called the hundley house if anybody ever wants to look it up it's the hundley house in carbondale illinois and uh you know prominent judge and his wife older lived in this house you know nice very nice house for the area which you know nearly a hundred years ago this area was entirely rural um and uh, what happened is that somebody broke into the house at night as the judge and his wife were getting ready to go to bed and shot them both. Killed them both. Um, and uh, the son was charged. The son who evidently lived, uh, I think, on the property or, or close by. Uh, was charged. Uh, I believe he was found not guilty at the time, although everyone pretty much thought that he had done it. Uh, I guess he had been cut from the will or in some way, you know, removed from his father's finances. So he had a, a motive. Um, but over the years, the house has, has been reported to, to be the site of some fairly active hauntings. I believe uh, it's up for sale right now. And I keep joking with my wife that we should buy it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm not sure that I want to become a slumlord here in Carbondale. <laughs> um, it's a, it's an enormous house. Uh, and I think it's pretty much sat vacant over the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, I've talked to a lot of people. I've gotten a couple of books, uh, from local authors that have been written on the subject. So, you know, there are aspects of that, uh, that I will fold into, uh, the story that I'm working on. Uh, and you know, since I, I do seem to have an affinity for this kind of small town Americana stuff, uh, you know, my story will definitely have that, that flavor. It's not going to be a, you know, it's not going to be a big city haunted house or a suburban haunted house. It'll definitely be a, a small town, uh, haunted house story. So, yeah, that to me that just makes it feel more personal, I and mean, it's I yeah, mean, I think really you, the way you want to do it, right? And I think also for a ghost story, because I've got to thinking about this as I was putting the idea together, is you set it in the suburbs or you set it close to your city, and you've got a lot of other stuff going on that I think kind of takes away from 
from the the supernatural aspect of the story. But I think if you stick it in an area that is uh, relatively undeveloped, um, a rural area, a small town, um, again, that that to me, or at least I hope it will with the story I'm working on, uh, it gives it that uh, more of a heightened sense of reality that I'm always looking for in what I write. So that when the supernatural stuff does come into play, you're totally, you're buying what's going on hook, line and sinker because I've grounded it effectively and in something that you can relate to more. Thank you so much for listening to part one of Conversation with John F.D. Taff. So this episode was the haunted house portion of the conversation. Next time we jump into more familiar This Is Horror territory, and we really delve into the writing and all that good stuff. And speaking of writing, I realize it's been a while since I've mentioned my own stories and there are a number of stories over on the Other Stories podcast that you can listen to in audio form. So most recently in June, the Other Stories released The Boy in the Penguin Costume. Before that in May, there was Should I Kill Myself or Have a Cup of Coffee? If you want to check out links to all of my writing and all of those stories then head over to michaeldavidwilson.co.uk forward slash writing. And if you do listen to my work, I would love you to drop me a line, either at Wilson the Writer on Twitter, or email me, michael at thisishorror.co.uk, and let me know what you think. Okay, before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. You're standing alone by the ocean. A beautiful girl moves towards you along the shore. Suddenly, you realize she's not human. You have nowhere to run as she slashes out, dragging you into the night waves. The debut novel from David Irons is a new chapter in terror. Night Waves, the novel from Cosmic Egg, an imprint of John Hunt Publications. Available now at all good bookshops. Now remember, if you like the show and you'd like to support us and you'd like to get every single episode ahead of the crowd, then you can become our patron at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get to hear every episode ahead of the crowd, but you can submit questions to each and every guest. We got so many great people coming up. We've got Brian Keane, Joseph DeLacy, Nick Corpen, Nicole Cushing, and T. E. Grau, just to name a few. And at three dollars, you also get Story Unboxed, a horror podcast on the craft of writing. And at ten dollars, you get the video cast on camera, off record, with myself and Bob Pastorella. And thank you to all the new patrons we've had in the last month. Thank you to Justin Lutz, Vincenzo Biloff, Brooks Oakley, Timothy P. Flynn, VR Weather, Brad Sanders, Carlo Bromley, and Austin Hatch. And if you want part of that sweet Patreon action, if you want all of those bonuses, if you want to be part of the family, part of the Writers Forum on Discord, then join us at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. As always, I would like to end with a quote. And given that Midsummer has just come out, I thought it would be appropriate to end with something from Ari Aster. So here it is. The beauty of the horror genre is that you can smuggle in these harder stories and the genre comes with certain demands, but mostly you need to find a catharsis in whatever story you're telling. What may be seen as a deterrent for audiences in one genre suddenly becomes a virtue in another genre. I'm looking forward to seeing Midsommar. Reports so far are that it's fantastic. I haven't heard anyone 
slating it yet. I'm sure I will because, you know, that is the nature of the internet and the nature of the critic. But pretty optimistic so far and hoping that I can see it in about a week or so. And indeed, avoid spoilers beforehand. So if you've seen it, please don't tweet me yet. Okay, I'll see you in the next episode. But until then, take care of yourselves. Be good to one another. Read horror. Keep on writing and have a great, great day.